Can we just say a word of God, a prayer, a word of prayer with it? Father, we want to thank you and bless you for your goodness, your mercies, your loving kindness. Thank you that it is there and rejoice in it. As a minister to our people, I ask that your spirit will brood over your word and give us understanding. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I've been asked to speak on preparing the nations for the return of Christ. Preparing the nations for the return of Christ. The first thing I want to say is that the church needs to be more proactive. Our messages must not be limited in the pulpits and the churches. We need to go beyond the church walls. Now, why we will not neglect the church? Because sometimes we need to re-evangelize those who are already in church. But beyond that, we need to reach out to the world using every possible media available. Mm -hmm. The electronics and print media and all social media, the satellite and all of that. And unless we begin to do this actively, the people that are on the church pews keep hearing the same message every day. They are edified, they probably are prepared for the return of Christ, but the rest of the world, the nations of the world are not prepared. Now, I'm going to look at this topic under some headings. Number one is, he is the God of nations. Then number two, the big part, he, Jesus Christ, and then the C part, what appears to be delay in the return of Jesus Christ is to give more people opportunity for repentance. D, why should people repent? And E, messages that will help the nation prepare for the return of Christ. So let me take you to one of the best introductions I know of as a God of the nations. Um, let me start reading from um, Acts chapter 17. Remember, Acts chapter 17 is what happened with Apostle Paul in Athens. And uh, he had to address the Eropagos. And in verse 22, Acts 17, 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Eropagos and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Now, look at from verse 24 to verse 28. And this is what I consider one of the best scriptures that introduces Jehovah as the God of the nations. Because our first message is to let the nations of the world know that he's not one of the gods. That he's not the God of Europeans. Like I heard somebody say, that he's not an African God. But we need to let the world know that Jehovah is the God of the nations. And this scripture will help convey this truth. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in the temple made with hands, but is still worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives to all life, health, and all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times 
and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from them, from each one of us. For in him, that is in God, we live and move and have our being. As also some of our quests have said, for we are so his offspring. Somebody say amen. So I am reading from the New King James Version. And this is a beautiful introduction of God. And we need to convince the nations of the world, as the Bible shows clearly, that there are great consequences for nations who reject Jehovah to worship other gods. Because it's not, why well, you could say it's optional to worship God or not. But we need to let the nations of the world know that there are grave consequences. Now look at the scripture of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 19 to 20. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 19 and 20. Then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you. So you shall perish because you will not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Amen. So that scripture is really very clear that if any nation chooses to turn away from Jehovah, and worships other gods, they will perish. The Lord will destroy them. And there has been a pattern in the past, as the scripture says clearly, where God brought destruction to nations that chose to serve idols, that chose to serve other gods. And we also need to say something very clearly that sometimes God speaks to nations and changes his mind. Sometimes people talk about the fact that when God speaks, he does whatever he says. Yes and no. God is able to do the things he says. But we need, need to be clear that there are times he speaks to nations and then he changes his mind and he doesn't do what he said he would do. And this is deliberate. Because what he will eventually do will depend on the response that he gets from an individual nation. For instance, if he speaks blessings upon the nation, say through a prophetic voice, through prophecy, and if that nation goes into depravity and rebellion and does abominable practices, the Lord will change his mind. And the blessings he spoke to execute on the nation will be aborted. On the same vein, if he speaks curses and judgment upon a nation, and the nation that is the recipient of those words of sanctions from God, repent and turn from wickedness, <coughs> excuse me, to serve the Lord and obey him, he'll change his mind, and the things he said will not happen. This is clearly portrayed in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 to 10. So I am saying in essence that the Bible makes it that there are situations in which God speaks and later changes his mind, depending on the response he gets from the nation he spoke about. Jeremiah 18, verse 7 to 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom to block up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken, <coughs> excuse me, turns from his evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to, to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, 
to build and to plant it if you don't people in my sight so that it does not obey my voice then i will relent concerning the good which i said i will benefit it wow so it's a god of nations he speaks concerning nations and he could change his mind all right let's go on to the next slide and you will see that the first thing that the church will do in preparing the nation for the return of Christ is to make it clear that Jehovah is the God of nations. I said it before, but I need to emphasize it. We need to send out the message unto all nations of the world here it, that Jehovah is the God of nations. And that obedience to his word brings blessings to the nations, and disobedience brings grave consequences. And this is said clearly in the scripture of Isaiah chapter 1, 19 and 20. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Hallelujah. Amen. Any nation that is willing and is obedient to the word of God will eat the good of the land, will get the blessing. But any nation that rebels and disobeys will have the sort of judgment. Mm. So let me therefore go to part B that Jesus Christ shall return. This is a message we must again send out to the nations. Jesus Christ shall return. Even in churches, there are some churches and some groups of people in churches that are not quite sure anymore if Jesus Christ shall return. There are some people, even those who are in church, that are not sure anymore whether there will be another heaven or hell. Because they think that when people are prospering and in wealth and riches and doing well, they are in heaven. And when people are suffering and going through hard times, they're in hell. So some people are not quite sure whether there is anything like Jesus returning and whether there's going to be eternal judgment or eternal reward. So I'm going to show us some very clear scriptures that we must send across to the church and the nations that Jesus Christ shall return. Now, the first one I like to take from Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfast, steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. And this message was, was, came from the angels. The men of Galilee were standing and gazing into the sky as Jesus ascended after his mission on earth. And then the angels spoke to them clearly. Why do you guess? This same Jesus, not another Jesus, this same Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, in the next slide, you will see another firm message that we must send across the world as we look at part C of this teaching. Now, what appears to be a delay in the return of Jesus Christ is to give more people opportunity for repentance. What appears to be a delay? Let me look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me start reading from verse 1 before I come to verse 3, where I want to learn first. Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 1. 
we must, we must release very firm, very strong messages. Now, beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, look at verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own laws, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Mm. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all, that all should come to repentance. Now, one of the things that the enemy is doing now is that the enemy is sending across messages across the world, across the nations of the world. And some people are mocking and living in depravity, doing riotous living, and, say, and saying that since it's been a long time we've been hearing this message that Jesus will come, will return. But he has not returned. And that the fathers of faith have long died. And all this continue as it was from the beginning. In other words, they're saying, stop waiting. Stop living a holy life. Stop believing that the Lord Jesus will return. It's taken so long since we began to hear the message and it will return. Now, but the Bible makes it clear that we must not forget one thing, that the Lord, without with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a, a thousand years is like one day. And that God is not failing in his promise that Jesus will return. But he's being patient. As a matter of fact, the New King James Version uses the word long-suffering. What people call Slackness is the long suffering of the Lord to benefit us. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, let's think about it. If the Lord Jesus returned some 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, some of us who are not Christians, some of us who were born before then, may not have made it. So because there was this delay, so-called delay, it gave us opportunity to repent and know the Lord. So what these mockers, these coffers call failure in the plan of God is deliberate to give us time to repent. Now, let's look at the next slide. Having said that the Apparent delay in the return of Jesus is to give us opportunity to repent. The next question is why should people repent? Why should people repent? And first of all, let me say that repentance takes place when one acknowledges that he's going the wrong way and does a U-turn to go the right way. And I need to say that repentance opens the doors of God's mercy. Repentance opens the doors of God's forgiveness. Repentance opens the doors of restoration. Repentance opens the doors of rehabilitation. Repentance opens the door that restores the authority of the believer to fight back the enemy. So repentance does a lot of things. And if you look at Proverbs 16, 25, I'm talking about why should people repent? Because there is a way that seems right to a man, 
but its, it's end is the world of death. So most people who may approve the way they are living, in nations they may approve what they are doing, but it will lead to death and destruction and internal damnation. And I'd like to also point out the scripture of Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Jeremiah 6, 16. First says the Lord, stand in the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So the nations must find the old path. Somebody may ask, how do they find the old path? First of all, through the scriptures, reading the scriptures and listening to the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, the apostles, the missionaries. Because every genuine servant of God that is proclaiming the gospel will, should reveal the old paths. So the Lord wants us to search for the old paths because there are too many ways now that have been offered to people in the world, to the nations for the world, but that is the old path. Excuse me. Now, let me also show you Acts 17 to the 9 to 31. This is a very strong scripture. It's an apt scripture and it tells us why people must repent. Now, first of all, it shows us what people tend to do and why they should repent. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shared by art and man's device. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooks, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, so he's saying that in the nations of the world, people create in their imagination the God they want to serve. I met a very educated man who was working in a big company. And he said to me that it's a terrible thing for a man to go after somebody else's wife. That adultery is wrong and nobody should get involved with adultery. But it will surprise you the next thing he said. He said to me that when there is consensus with a lady that is not married, there is nothing wrong with sexual relationship, whether you are married or not, as long as the lady you are going out with, as long as your same partner is single and you have not raped her, that there's nothing wrong with such sexual relationship. So people create God for themselves. And this scripture is saying that it would be wrong to think that in divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, objects that you can carve into whatever you choose. No. He says these are, the, when people talk like this, were times of ignorance. And now that God demands that people repent. And then the scripture also goes on to tell us why people must repent. Because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. Remember, not the world, the nations of the world. In righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Hallelujah. So why should people repent from their different ideas and concepts of God? Because God has appointed a day in which he will judge the nations of the world in righteousness. The Lord has also appointed a man whom he has commissioned this judgment to. And The man he's talking about by raising him from the dead, he prepares him. So before I hand up this message, there are messages that will help the nations prepare for the return of Christ. And in this teaching, I have deliberately allowed the scriptures to speak for themselves. 
because the word of God is eternal. The Bible says that scriptures shall not be broken. Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth will pass away, but no iota of his word will pass away. That's why in this teaching, we have deliberately allowed the word of God to speak for itself. So let me emphasize some more scriptures that will help the nations prepare for the return of Christ before I round up this ministration. Number one is, is the interesting thing that Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 13, verse 5. I'd like you to take note that these words were not spoken by any apostle or any disciple of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus himself spoke these words. He says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mm. So our message to the nation should be clear. Listen, sometimes evil things happen to evil people. And you can't sit back and say, this is happening to them because they alone are evil. Jesus is saying that unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Luke 13 verse 5. Now, this other message is a message I like. Can I tell you why I like First Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6? There are some denominations in the Christian religion, I deliberately said Christian religion, where people tell you the best way to approach Jesus Christ or God the Father. They come from the point of view of human reason and said that if you want to get something from a man, if you spoke to his mother, then you are most likely to have what you're asking for because his mother will influence him. In other words, we can go through the mother. Some will say you can go through his father. Some will say you can go through an angel to approach the Lord. Now, first of all, let me remind you what Jesus Christ said about approaching his own father, Jehovah. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one cometh to the Father except by me. So the only access to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is no other name given under heaven unto men by which we shall be saved. I think that is Acts chapter 12, verse 4. No other name can bring salvation. And Acts 2 verses 5 and 6, 5 to 6, 5 and 6, therefore is important because it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. One God, one mediator. Not one God, not many gods and many mediators. Not one God and many mediators, but one God and one mediator. And the Bible says, the word of God says clearly that this mediator is Jesus Christ. And to prove that he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He died for the sins of the nations of the world. Only his blood can wash away sin. No other detergent. Is strong enough to wash away sins. He died and shed his blood to wash away the sins of the people of the nations of the world. So Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Not his father, not his mother, not one of his angels, not a holy man, not a teacher, not a prophet. And we need to pass this strong message across the nations of the world. Now, the other scripture there, Revelation 21, verse 8, is important. 
He says that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So cowardly are those of the nations who know that they should commit their lives and their ways to Jesus Christ. But they are not able to have the courage to do so. So out of cowardice, they do not take a stand for Jesus. The unbelieving adults do not believe. You know abominable people, you know murderers, you know sexual immoral people, you know the sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall end up in the death of fire. This is a strong message we must pass to the nations of the world. Now, the next slide will show you that even for believers, and I, and I like you to listen carefully, when you become born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't still be complacent. You can't still be confident about going to heaven. That's what I learned from this scripture of Luke 21, 34, 36. Even for those who are believers in Christ, those who are born again, you still need to watch yourself and be careful how you live. And then there are prayers you need to pray to, so that you will have the backing of heaven, the backing of God, to make it and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. At the last day, it says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all those things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Hallelujah. Yeah. So that scripture is saying, be careful how you live. And then watch and pray. It, it's not enough for you to be careful. The enemy will set traps. It will set traps through your marriage, through your job, through your business, even through the ministry. That's where you need God. It is not by might, not by power, but by the spirit that he will help you to go through whatever the enemy will throw at you to stand before the Son of Man. And, and that's why you must pray. I think that many believers are not doing that. To pray that the God Almighty will help them in this Christian race to make it to the end and stand before Jesus Christ. Now, in the next slides, you will notice something that is very important. The Lord Jesus Christ will judge the nations, as the Bible shows clearly in Matthew 25, from 31. When he comes, he will sort out the sheep nations and the good nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the good angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one. He will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goods, and he will set the sheep on his right hand for the goods on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you bless of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cast into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is interesting. The final sorting out, the final judgment that the Lord Jesus Christ will do. It is to separate the sheep nations from the old nations. The sheep nations are nations who obey him, who lived by the standards of the word of God. 
and then he will say to them, those who bless of his right hand, come, you bless of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then the good nations he will put on the left hand. These are nations that did not honor the Lord, did not acknowledge him, did not obey him, did not serve him. And he will say to the good nations, the, the ones on the left, on his left side, depart from me, you cast into the everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Hallelujah. I'm going to round up now with a prayer. Can I ask you to make a commitment to the Lord that you will live holy and that you will be careful about how you live your life, that you will develop courage to live by the scriptures because in the changing world, in the sophisticated world, it will be a challenge to live by the standards of the word of God. But you need to make a commitment to the Lord. Help me. Even if I face persecution, I will live by the standards of your word. And can I also ask you to make a commitment that you use every avenue available to you to send up this message to the nations, to your relations, to your family, to your cities, because many people have not heard. And I use it every opportunity to show people and lead people back to Christ and to help them to prepare for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Lord I bless Jesus. you for Reverend Light and his team for the great work Lord they are doing, anchoring this vision from Cape Town, Cape Town South Africa. I want to thank you for people that are connected from the nations of the world. And I, I ask that your word has gone forth, that it shall not return to you void without accomplishing that for which it was sent. And why it was sent is for the salvation of souls. It was sent to prepare people, to prepare nations for the return of Jesus Christ. It was sent so that fewer people will go to hell. From Matthew 25, verse 41, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. So that fewer people will go to hell and that heaven will be completed. That the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think because we pray with thanksgiving. Yes, in Jesus' mighty name. And the people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Apostle Onyechi Daniel. We celebrate you, sir. The Lord bless you abundantly.